Good afternoon. Welcome to our headliner speakmaker at the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Hilda Sharma, the membership secretary of the National Press Club, and the founder and editor of Global Strategy. Imagine an election in which more than 77% of eligible voters participated. Then imagine those voters spread across 30 different countries. And finally, imagine them voting for a government in exile. Our guest today, the democratically elected leader of the Central Tibetan Administration. The Tibetan government in exile doesn't have to imagine it, because that is what happened in 2021. <coughs> when Penpasering was elected as Sikyong. Sikyong Penpasering was sworn in on May 27, 2021, at an official ceremony graced by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who devoted his political authority to the elected leadership in 2011. Sikyong Sering was born in India. He was a student at Madras Christian College in Chennai when he joined the Tibetan Freedom Movement. He was elected to Tibet's Parliament in Exile in 1996 and served as Speaker of the Parliament from 2008 to 2016. He subsequently served as a representative of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government in exile in North America. Sikyang <coughs> Sering is here today to tell us why, in a world where a dozen countries are at war, migrants are either escaping their homelands in flimsy boats on the Mediterranean or walking hundreds of miles before crossing the Rio Grande River. And climate change seems to be wrecking chaos all over this planet. Tibet must also remain on the international agenda. Please join me in welcoming Sikyong Professor to the National Festival. <laughs> Starts from Western Tibet, 
close to Eastern Tibet, takes a huge one and comes to India and Bangladesh. So we are talking about 10 different countries, and these countries are some of the most densely populated areas in the world. So uh, unfortunately, China does not share any hydrological data with any of its downstream countries, and none of these countries are able to speak up uh, to China about these issues. And this is a serious issue, because some people say that third world war could happen because of water. And, uh, we are talking about serious water security and food security issues in the region. Sometimes I say we are political refugees today, but if you don't care for Tibet's environment, there could be a lot more environmental refugees in the future. So just the, the environmental and ecological importance of Tibet is not only for Tibet, but it's global. The jet streams that flow over the Tibetan plateau and the El Nino effect defines the monsoon rainfall in the region. And just as recent as a few months back, there was also a scientific study about the correlation between the climatic conditions in the plateau of Tibet and the Amazon, which is the lung of the world, and Tibet, the of the, the, the world. When there's more rain in the Amazon, there is less snow in Tibet. When there is more snow in Tibet, there is less rain in uh, the Amazon. So uh, this is a very, very important issue. And the geostrategic uh, importance of Tibet, because Tibet remains uh, the political buffer between the two most populous nations in this world, India and China. So till China, Communist China invaded Tibet, there was never ever a boundary between India and China. There was never ever a war between India and China. Only after Communist China invaded Tibet. There was the first war of 1962 between uh, India and China, and the belligerence of the, the Chinese government on the Indian border still persists. And uh, uh, I can say that over the years, uh, I think this is one of the the, the, the relation between China and India is, is, is Nadir, the worst, worst point. And uh, then now in this world, at this time, as we speak, there's so much violence in this world, including Israel and Hamas. And we have followed the policy of middle way. The policy of middle way is based on this concept, avoiding extreme polarities. One is the polarity of Tibet as an, uh, historically as an independent state, and the other polarity is the situation of Tibet under the repressive communist government right now. So we are finding a middle way where the Tibetans will have the freedom to preserve its language, its religion, its culture, its way of life, and its environment. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much focus on non-violent movements. We are, His Holiness has always been saying that if Tibetans take up violence, he will be more responsible for uh, the cause of Tibet. And from 2009 till about last year, <clears throat> there have been 157 self accommodations inside Tibet. And uh, Tibetans, it's not as if the Tibetans can't kill Chinese people, but they burn themselves to, to death, hoping against hope that the Chinese government will pay some attention to their plight, or hoping against hope that the international community will come to their rescue. So the freedom that you that the free world take it for so granted does not exist in Tibet. Uh, you very well know that Freedom House has designated Tibet as one of the least free country in this world alongside South Sudan and North Korea. And uh, there is no political space whatsoever. Uh, George Orwell's 1984 is coming into reality in, in, in the whole of China and more so in the regions of Tibet and East Pakistan, Mongolia. Uh, very, very unfortunate. Even in this century, you have no access to Tibet. And that's why the United States have this law called the Rata Act, where reciprocity is the norm of diplomacy, or the foundation for diplomacy. If you have a visa to come to, if a Chinese person has a visa to come to the United States, they can visit any parts of the United States. Whereas if a US citizen has a visa to go to China, then you need another permit to go into Tibet. That is how restricted Tibet is to the outside world's 
and sometimes China calls to it as a socialist paradise. And so in that case, why don't you allow people to see the paradise for themselves and decide for themselves whether it's a paradise or it's a hell right now. And then we are talking about a million children in colonial style boarding schools. When you point that out to the Chinese government, then they point fingers at the United States and say, how did you treat your native people? Or the Canadians with the First Nations? Or even with the scattered events with the Sami people? or the Australians with the Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders and New Zealanders with the Irish people. So they know exactly what these countries did, you know, and it was wrong. And these countries are trying to make up for the wrongs they did. But China is deliberately doing it in, inside uh, Tibet, striking at the very root of our identity, our language. And of course, Tibetan language has nothing to do with Chinese language. Tibetan script came from India. Tibetan Buddhism also came from India. We translated every available Sanskrit and uh, Pali text into Tibetan from 8th century to 12th century before Buddhism vanished from India. And we are proud to feel that we are a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom. So when they are striking at the very root of our identity, in the form of boarding schools where you are taught only in Mandarin. Now there are only four classes. Now we hear that in the eastern part of Tibet, in Kanzi Prefecture, they are uh, going to do away with the Tibetan classes uh, from this year. So if this is successful, they will implement it in the whole of Tibet. And they are changing the names of places. Even a small village, you know, then, right, we must have seen there was a more symposium of Tibetan academics. In China, they decided to call Tibet Shisa. Mm. And this is not just changing the name of a country, it has its political connotations. Because when China refers to Shisa, they are referring to only Tibet Autonomous Region, not the other regions of Tibet. So it has a lot of political significance also why China is doing this. And they relegate that to an academic decision rather than a political decision. In fact, they've been using this since 2019. Uh, and I, I request the free board not to fall into the trap of, trap of Chinese government's uh, policies and programs that are aimed at the eradication of the Tibetan population. Religious freedom does not exist. And, uh, they even want to be now, apart from you know, not allowing the monks and nuns to, uh, for uh, the freedom of movement, there are a lot of surveillance in the monasteries. Chinese government that does not believe in any religion wants to be responsible for setting up curriculums, Buddhist curriculums, in the monastic institutions. Number of monks and nuns have come down drastically from thousands of monks now to 400, 500 monks in the major monasteries. And if a person wants to become a monk or a nun, you need four guarantors to make sure that this person will not take up any political activity. And today, if I think about self-immolating myself, I may die, I may get scarred for life, but Chinese government has collected DNA samples of Tibetans, iris scans of Tibetans, geolocation and electronic identification. All my relatives become the first kind of suspects. That's how gridlocked the system is. So over the last 20 years, Chinese government has moved all the Tibetan nomadic communities into sedentarized communities. It's easier for them to control. They can't send one army after one Tibetan in the Himalayas, in the mountains. So <clears throat> it is, uh, and they have, it's more like uh, what SS used to do in East Germany, where everybody is spying on each other. So I met some people who just came from back from Tibet, and they said it's, it's a very an atmosphere of fear. You can't trust anybody. You don't know whom to talk to what, because you don't know whether you're going to report it on what you say. And uh, at a larger level, you must have seen this anti-espionage law in in, uh, in, in, China, in China. But I don't uh, think China is as strong as uh, the, the rest of the world perceive they think it's very monolithic, very strong, but there are a lot of things in China's arm. In the Politburo of seven members, where now everybody says it's Xi's people, there's nobody from Fujitabs or Transimage no more. So 
even then, not more than three members of the Politburo can meet without the permission of the President, which means that they are free from internal coup. President Xi also made sure that he transferred every single general every year to different places so that the generals don't build better relations with the cadres. That also rules out military coup. And China is the only country that spends more money on internal security than external security. That manifests a deep distrust between the rulers and the root, including the Han Chinese people, not just Tibetans, or Uyghurs, or Mongols, or Manchus, or Hong Kongers. So China wants the Western markets, the European market. They want better relations with the United States just because they need United States markets. They need the US Southeast Asia market, but they don't want the free world to come in that region to control their hegemonistic uh, ambitions and the bellicosity towards Taiwan. Or some people ask why China is having this belligerent attitudes toward India and the South China Sea and the Sankaku and all those. I believe that this will be used, these hotspots will be used when there is a threat to the survival of the Communist Party. And depending on the severity of the threat, if the threat is very, very severe, then only they might attack Taiwan. To such a time, I don't see much danger. I'll close here and I'll take questions after this. Thank you very much. <coughs>